On the 31st of May 1908, Marguerite Stenaille was found bound and gagged in her Paris home, while in the other rooms, her husband and mother had been killed. Ten years earlier, she had been involved in another scandal, as she had been pleasuring the French president moments before his death. So, were these tragedies coincidences, or was there actually something more sinister going on? Join me to explore her story. The woman known today and to history as Marguerite Stenil was born as Marguerite Jean Jappy in the Bocor region of northeastern France on the 16th of April 1869. She was called Meg by those close to her and came from a prosperous middle class family, her father Edouard having managed to become a successful industrialist, while her mother Emily was the daughter of an innkeeper. Meg's wealthy background meant she received a good education, even having her own governess, and this would serve her in later years. When she was 17, Meg got involved with a friend of her brother's, but soon things went too far, and her father had to step in and break things up. Meg was very close to her father, and was devastated when in 1888, he died of a heart attack. With her father's death, Meg's aspirations to become a part of Parisian society grew, and in the coming years, she gravitated toward the French capital, where she would involve herself in various scandals. Before Meg went to live in Paris, she headed to Bayonne in the south of France to visit her sister. She was around 20 at the time, and it was here that she met Adolphe Stenail, a French artist nearly twice her age. He soon fell in love with Meg, and the pair married in 1890. Thus, Meg acquired the name she is more well known by today, Marguerite Stenail. Her husband was the son of Louis Charles Stenail, a relatively successful artist, executing some of the frescoes which adorn the Cathedral of Strasbourg today, though Adolphe only eked out a living through his painting. The pair went to live in Paris during the Belle Epoque, a period of immense artistic achievement in the French capital's history, during which it became the cultural capital of the world. Despite not being wealthy, their lives would have been lived in one of the most vibrant spaces in the world in modern times, frequenting the Moulin Rouge and other cabaret and dance halls of the time, and rubbing shoulders with some of the leading literary figures of the time. About a year later, the couple welcomed a child, but they soon fell out, and although they didn't divorce, they would live apart. It was now that Marguerite became what is referred to as a demi-mondaine, a woman of the demi-monde, or half-world, in other words, a courtesan. In the course of the 1890s, Marguerite became celebrated for her beauty and her discreet love affairs. She had many notable suitors, some very well known, but none more so than Félix Faure, a prominent French politician. Coming originally from a fairly humble background, he had risen through the ranks of French political life during the era of the Third Republic that followed the Franco-Prussian War in the early 1870s to, somewhat against expectations, become the French president in 1895. He would hold that position for just over four years, until an unexpected event involving Marguerite occurred. Marguerite met and began an amorous relationship with Thor in 1897, when he was already over two years into his term as President of the Republic. This continued intermittently for the next two years. Matters came to a head early in 1899. According to a newspaper report at the time, on the 16th of February 1899, Thor was in the Elysa Palace in Paris, when he suddenly emerged from his office into the ante-office. There he informed his secretary that he did not feel well. Doctors soon attended, but the president died later that evening. The exact circumstances of what had happened have been widely reported on and debated. Most agree that at the time he became ill, Thor had been in his office of Marguerite, where they engaged in sexual activities of one kind or another 
on his office desk. Which type of activities were being performed on him is a matter of contention. What is clear is that whatever Marguerite was doing appears to have led President Faure, who was in his late 50s and in increasingly poor health, to have a heart attack or some other medical incident, most likely a stroke, which he died from not long afterwards. Not all media outlets reported on this. One prominent international newspaper at the time, for instance, made no mention of Stenail and her alleged involvement in the death. It simply stated that Faure had died the previous evening in Paris, quite suddenly, of an apoplectic seizure. It was noted that he had recently been confirmed as having a serious illness, and that his heart had been affected for some months past. This was reported on as far afield as Australia, and there was no controversy surrounding the circumstances of his death in the immediate aftermath of it. Despite these initial reports, Marguerite and her relationship with the deceased president eventually became a source of some media scrutiny and have remained so ever since. Some studies conclude that she was partially responsible for his stroke, others that she was not even present at the time. What is clear is that Marguerite became established afterwards as a relatively scandalous figure in Parisian life, though amongst some, it actually enhanced her reputation. Certain men in French society were fascinated that Marguerite was so skilled in the bedroom, or office in this case, that she made the president have a fit of passion so intense that it killed him. Thus, despite this scandal, her salon would still be frequented by many notable men, maintaining her position as a socialite and having numerous affairs after this. You may wonder if her husband knew of these affairs and why he put up with it. Well, he did know, but Marguerite still cared for her husband and his career, and many of her lovers commissioned paintings from him, allowing Adolphe to make a good living. The death of her lover was complicated in the weeks and months that followed, as speculation arose that Faure's death was in some way connected to the Dreyfus affair that was perpetually in the French news between 1894, when it first broke, down to 1906. This concerned the French military official Alfred Dreyfus, who was initially accused in 1894 of passing military secrets to the German government. Dreyfus, a Jewish man, was found guilty and shipped off to a penal colony, but reports emerged over the years which proved his innocence. The Dreyfus affair became a major issue within French society, one in which the wider issue of anti-Semitism within French society was being debated. Reports arose in 1899 that Marguerite had secretly received documents concerning Dreyfus and his case, and that this was somehow tied into the death of the president during their engagement. Also, the anti-Dreyfus opposition accused Marguerite of having poisoned Felix Faure on behalf of the so-called Jewish syndicate, because the president had declared himself hostile to a review of the Dreyfus affair. Yet, there isn't a single piece of concrete evidence to support this. It was simply a late 19th century conspiracy theory. Further controversy was to surround Marguerite within a decade of the Four Affair. In the intervening period, she continued to bring guests to her salon and to work as a courtesan, and lived a life similar to the one she had lived in the 1890s before the Four Affair. We might call this subsequent incident the Stenile Affair. On the 31st of May 1908, she was found by police in her and her husband's Paris residence. She was bound and gagged when police entered and discovered her there, but was otherwise not harmed and was still healthy. The same could not be said for her husband and Marguerite's mother, both of whom were found dead elsewhere in the apartment, having been strangled to death. The revelation of what had happened at the Stenail residence, a story involving the woman at the centre of the Four Affair nearly ten years earlier, inevitably caused a press frenzy. This was exacerbated by Marguerite herself, who added a layer of mystery to the events by claiming that four individuals dressed in black robes had entered their home and tied her up 
before killing her husband and mother. As elaborate as Marguerite's story was, police were suspicious that she had been responsible for what had happened, and had subsequently tied herself up in order to appear to be one of the victims. They could not find strong supporting evidence for this in the immediate investigation, but they were suspicious as to why she was spared, and the fact that nothing substantial had been stolen. So, when Marguerite seemed to be trying to direct them towards a servant of the Stenyles, suggesting he'd been responsible for the break-in and murders, along with some accomplices, they decided to arrest her on the basis of evidence tampering in late November, half a year after the murders had been committed. Marguerite was sent to the Saint-Lazare prison on the way from Paris to the suburb of Saint-Denis. It had been established as a boarding house for those suffering from leprosy in medieval times, though over time it had morphed into a kind of early modern insane asylum, and then a prison. It was here that she would be kept under detention while her case was processed, and she stood trial in 1909. Marguerite's case began in the summer of 1909, and proceeded through the autumn, only finally concluding in the early winter of that year. It became a source of national scandal, with everyone wanting tickets to the trial, and the case was constantly being debated in the salons of Paris that year. Firstly, there was the sheer fact that Mrs. Denile, nearly a decade after her role in the Four Affair, had suddenly returned to the national newspapers in a similarly mysterious case, which led to the death of her husband and mother. The papers called this case the impasse ranson crime, and commented on the disturbing attitude of Marguerite, who didn't seem too distressed or saddened by what had happened. Some suspected she had ordered the murders so that she could later remarry, but it was a weak motive. Many people did not believe her story, and there seemed to be evidence which contradicted what she was claiming. Conspiracy theories abounded as well, with the pronounced anti-Semitism of the time re-emerging, along with claims about her alleged role in the Dreyfus Affair, which had continued in France until 1906, when Dreyfus had finally been exonerated. The judge, who was clearly against Marguerite, added fuel to the fire by suggesting that Stenile's evidence was not credible, calling her stories tissues of lies, and going through a list of her affairs. Despite all of this, Marguerite handled the situation excellently, lying when necessary, and admitting mistakes if needed. She blamed any and all inconsistencies on police incompetence, and stayed true to her story that the crimes were perpetrated by four robbers dressed in black. As there was no real evidence to substantiate any alternative theory, in November 1909, after months of deliberation, Marguerite was found not guilty. The truth of what actually occurred in her and her husband's home in the early summer of 1908 will never be fully known. After the scandal of her trial, imprisonment and release, Marguerite elected to leave France and seek a less controversial life in England, settling in London in the early 1910s. Prior to this, her daughter had gone to live with her deceased father's extended family, and was forbidden from contacting her mother. They were estranged for several years, but they eventually reconciled in 1911. In England, Marguerite began an effort to clear her name to some extent in the court of public opinion, composing her memoirs which defended her actions in the 1890s and 1900s, and publishing them in 1912. They were only partly successful in doing so, though they have been extensively scrutinised by scholars since, to examine how a woman accused in the way which she was in Belle Epoque, France, characterised her own defence and actions. The rest of Marguerite's life was comparatively less colourful. She married again, this time in 1917, to a noted British lawyer and minor peer, Robert Scarlett, the sixth Baron Arbinger. The marriage would last down to his relatively premature death a decade later, in 1927. Marguerite was entering her late forties when they married, and they could not have children. After his passing, 
Marguerite lived out a quiet life in southern England for over a quarter of a century, dying on the 17th of July 1954 at 85 years of age in the seaside town of Hove on the English Riviera. Her story has been popularised on several occasions in recent years, though there is still considerable debate as to what exactly happened both in 1899 and 1908. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Marguerite Stenile. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life down below in the comments and if you have any suggestions, also be sure to leave them down below in the comments. I hope you guys are subscribed and are notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.